Bird species in honor of Dr. Robert Eichen. Let me remind you uh, again of the people who contributed financial funds to helping us bring our speakers to this meeting. These include Texaco, Perkin Elmer, the Colloid Division, and the Petro Petroleum Research Fund. Our first speaker this morning is Professor Norman Shepard from the University of East Anglia. He's going to give us a perspective of development in the vibrational spectroscopy of absorbed species since the early 1960s. Professor Shepard. Well, thank you, George. I was uh, very pleased indeed when I heard of this symposium in honor of, of, of Bob Eichens. And the fact his influence is so strong 40 years later speaks for itself, I think. I've always been a, a great admirer of the work of, of his group. And of course, he got, it, got us off with new experimental techniques. And whatever the philosophers say, I think new experimental techniques contribute quite as much as new theories to the progress of science. And the, uh, as my students know, I'm a very fussy writer of papers. I like to get it right. I know nobody who writes papers more clearly and precisely than Bob. I have, if you read one of his papers, you'll have a feeling that every sentence has been mulled over. And that's very important in an area like this, particularly if you want to learn what the how the experiment was actually done. Uh, and uh, in, in every respect, I've, 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 I've thought that the contributions from his group have been first rate uh, not only technically, but also in, in uh, uh, the full academic sense. My first contact with Bob was indirect through his colleague, Stan Francis, because I had been, uh, this is, at this time I was in Cambridge University before I knew, moved to the new University of East Anglia, and I'd been invited over to a Gordon conference, and I was describing some work that we had just recently done on molecules physically absorbed on high area porous glass. And after my talk, uh, Stan Francis came up to me and said, well, that was very interesting. I have a colleague who has managed to get spectra from carbon monoxide on, uh, on metal samples. I said, really? That's something. Uh, that's, uh, and the, the, the difference between what we were doing then and what Bob started at that time was that we moved from physical absorption to chemisorption. And all the time I had in the back of my mind, if only we could contribute to real chemical problems like catalysis. Uh, and uh, uh, so, and as a matter of fact, immediately I said to myself, I wonder if you could apply it to hydrocarbons on surfaces. And I went back to Cambridge and with my colleague, uh, um, David Yates, we actually started to do work with finely divided metaparticles in porous glass. Now that, that, had, that medium had its limitations because of the strong background from the glass, but that, that got us started. And then next time I came to the States, I made a point of visiting uh, Bob at Beacon uh, and had a most stimulating uh, visit. Well now, what I'm going to try to do this morning is give you some sort of, of perspective. Um, uh, we're, uh, we're going to, as it were, fly over the top of this area to see what different aspects there are. And of course, I can't give a complete account. It's a huge area. Uh, also, I apologize that the graphics are not exactly the end of the 20th century graphics. I've yet to <coughs> learn to use either a PC or a word processor. But on the other hand, I have been reading the literature with, with enthusiasm for 50 years. And so that, that's my qualification to be standing up here. So anyway, let's, I started off by writing down some of the aspects of, of the work that might be of interest. There are different types of surfaces. There are different types uh, of adsorbates on those surfaces. Uh, and there are different spectroscopic techniques. As you see, my first effort was not complete. I uh, belatedly realized I had missed out a rather important field of the application of vibrational spectroscopy to, to, to semiconductors. So that's a huge area, and let me draw your attention to the fact that nowadays there are more than 500 papers a year published uh, which use vibrational spectra from absorbed species. And so obviously I have to be selective, and obviously that selection has to be based on my own 
experience to a degree. So what I propose to do I can line this up somewhere, where are we? is to start off by talking about work on metal surfaces for the very good reason that metal surfaces have been used more than any others for developing the newer vibrational spectroscopy techniques. Today, uh, infrared spectroscopy, particularly its FDIR form, is still the most widely used spect uh, spectroscopic technique for getting the, the uh, information about uh, surface species. But nowadays, there are a lot of other uh, techniques. Of course, Raman spectroscopy one immediately thinks of if, if, if one is a, a vibrational spectroscopist. Uh, electrons in elastic electron tunneling spectroscopy, but particularly electron energy loss spectroscopy, I like to put a V in front for vibrational, uh, has been enormously important and got us into the area of uh, single monolayers on flat surfaces. But the original uh, uh, emphasis in that area, using reflection absorption into red spectroscopy with flat metal surfaces and a monolayer on top, actually also came uh, from, from uh, Bob's laboratory uh, in, in, uh, in Texaco by Stan Francis. There was a, a very pioneering paper by Francis Nelson in which they showed that with, the, 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 with a flat metal surface and with a long chain carboxylate, you could measure uh, spectra using uh, up-to-date infrared <coughs> techniques and furthermore that paper sorted out a very important thing that we now all use on metal surfaces, the metal surface selection rule. That was a very Im important start and that was the, the beginning of looking at monolayers on flat surfaces. A very important development which the electron spectroscopies uh, gave uh, great impetus to. So I shall be talking about one or two examples of diatomic molecules and hydrocarbons uh, from the point of view of metal surfaces. When we come to the oxides and the zeolites, then uh, Raman spectroscopy comes more into the picture because the, uh, the very strong spectra of the <coughs> oxides themselves mask a lot of the spectrum uh, in the infrared, but that very high polarity of the oxide usually means relatively weak uh, Raman features. So Raman spectroscopy comes into its own uh, as we move from metals uh, to oxides. But then there are other areas, like halides, which I might have touched depending on how time goes. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of interest in this, the low temperature spectra of ice to do with uh, uh, catalytic reactions in clouds in the upper atmosphere. Uh, semiconductors using ATR have been usefully used. And there is a prospect, increasing prospect in the future that one can look not at just gas solid uh, interfaces, but at uh, interfaces between two liquids or, or in between high pressure gases and, and solids and the like. So I'm going to start with metals. I take it that if, if you read the, the, the uh, uh, abstracts of the papers in this session, uh, we are, the most of us are really basically interested in finely divided surfaces. Um, the point I want to make very clearly is if you want to understand finely divided surfaces, you should make every use you can of work on flat single crystals using the, 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 the different techniques. Uh, Raman is less used for metal simply because the, the, the uh, uh, supported metal sample typically is either black or highly colored. There are heating effects from Raman spectroscopy which leads to decomposition uh, and the like. Um, so FTIR is, is supreme, I think, for the finely divided metal catalysts. As you go to the single crystals, you come to the reflection absorption infrared. I've already mentioned Stan Francis and his colleague got it going. Bob Greenler put us on a firm footing on the theoretical side. John Pritchard at Queen Mary College in, in, in England uh, uh, showed how you could apply it to single crystal surfaces, ordered surfaces, under UHV. And my colleague in, in East Anglia, Mike Chesters, uh, then added the FT component to that type of work and turned it into a, a much more uh, uh, important and widely used technique. But in the meanwhile, vibrational spectroscopy in the form of, a, of electron energy loss spectroscopy had come in with higher sensitivity and had given a great stimulation to the infrared spectroscopists. 
So as I say, my theme here is to say the spectra on finely divided surfaces can be better understood with the help of single crystal models. So let's start where Bob started with uh, CO um, on, on the metals. And uh, I just apologise to him that I did redraw some of his original spectra, uh, linear in wave numbers, just to be consistent with the rest of, my, uh, of, of the spectra that I show. Those were his original spectra. At various times, people have argued that, that you don't see bridge species on copper. I always used to say, oh, yes, you do. Bob Eichen showed them in his first paper. Well, we now understand uh, the, how to assign these spectra, and essentially it was as Bob uh, suggested to us, Though at that time, I think he actually only had one paper in the literature uh, on uh, uh, metal carbonyl uh, compounds, Schelling and Pitzer, which did actually show bridged and linear species. But anyway, we now have these characteristic regions with which we can uh, uh, um, attribute different types of surface species. When single crystal work came along uh, with the technique that, that Stan Francis had developed, um, Alex Bradshaw and others in, in early made very good use of it and did very nice studies of CO on 111 and 100 faces of palladium as a function of coverage. And they showed that both of these, at, at uh, essentially saturation coverage, had bridge species, but those bridge species were, were appreciably different in wave number on, on, the, two, on the two surfaces. And it was interesting to go back and look to quite an early paper in the literature uh, on a finely divided uh, palladium silica catalyst by Badur, Modell and Goldsmith, I think at MIT, and to, to realize that uh, uh, within the contour, this broad contour of the bridge species, one can probably pick out those components which corresponding to these particular crystal faces. These were the two different wave numbers associated with the two-fold bridge species at saturation coverage uh, done by single crystal work, and you can see that they correspond to two of the, main, the two main features in the spectra of the adsorbed species. But the interest of this work was that, that they showed that the catalyst changed. There was a change in the catalyst, newly prepared, and after it had actually been used or broken in uh, uh, for the uh, uh, oxidation of carbon monoxide. This was the spectrum of the new catalyst, and you can see there are various sub-features corresponding to, to different species. But after the reaction had occurred at elevated temperatures, the spectrum had changed quite a bit in that the uh, intensity had piled up at higher wave numbers. And what had clearly happened, among other things, was a change in the ratio of probably the 100 and the 111 facets on the catalyst. So here we were using carbon monoxide to actually tell us something about the nature of the catalyst surface uh, before and after uh, it had been used. The fact that this long tail disappeared showed that, in effect, the rougher parts of the catalyst had crystallized, and more of the catalyst now had well-defined facets uh, after the experiment. But then I want to move on to a, a system which has both fascinated and irritated me uh, <laughs> Uh, in the end, I was very pleased when we finally managed to understand it uh, over a period of about 20, to, between 20 and 30 years. And that's the, the system of ethylene on silica supported platinum. Of course, we did all sorts of other studies during this period on other metals on oxides, but this particular one, I always had problems in understanding, and so we, 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 we persisted. We used, of course, the techniques that Bob uh, pioneered, except we did go to the press disc technique where you have your finely divided <coughs> particles of the reduced salts into metal uh, on the silica all pressed together into a disc. The silica, uh, the, one of the limitations of, of oxide supported metals uh, spectra <coughs> is, is the spectrum of the oxide itself and so the hatch parts are the spectra of the silica support. Below 1300 wave numbers this is the region of, of of silica, uh, silica framework uh, fundamentals, complete blackout. We get a number of overtones here, and then we have the chemically bound OHs on the surface of the silica after, of course, any, any, any water has been cleaned off. And that gave us a very nice window in the region of 3,000 wave numbers where the CA stretching modes are. So that was what we aimed at, and of course, before we published anything, Bob had published some very nice spectra of hydrocarbons uh, on a nickel silica catalyst. 
At that time, we didn't have the ratioing facilities, and we found it difficult to be certain about the bands down here because they're relatively weak in the angle deformation region, and uh, they're on rapidly sloping backgrounds. Bob had a rather carefully contrived uh, uh, way of, of, of doing that in, at a very early stage. So we said, let's look at ethylene on platinum, and let's see what we can find. A classic catalytic reaction. What uh, is the catalytic reactive surface complex? Well, of course, the suggestions in the literature uh, were that uh, the ethyl group would be uh, associated with it. And before that, the, the, it w the question was what form was the ethylene chemisorbed? Was it as what we call a disigma species, where the double bond opened out to form uh, this type of, of species? Or was it, and at this, at this time in the 1950s, the pi complex was just becoming fashionable in inorganic chemistry, was it a uh, type of species, a pi complex to a single metal atom? But it was also known that very often when you put ethylene on a catalyst, first of all, you've got some ethane off. There had to be some dissociatively adsorbed species present, which might be something of this sort or of this sort. But in principle, by infrared spectroscopy, we could at least distinguish the ethylenic type species from the, uh, 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 from the alkane uh, type species. And so we set to work to see what we could find. I had uh, uh, Michael Clark, who I may say is one of my graduate students, who nowadays is one of the very few scientifically trained MPs in the House of Commons. Uh, uh, started work with the with the uh, uh, um, metal on on the uh, um, um, porous glass, but then we turned to our press disc using Cabasil that Bob had suggested, and John Ward and Barry Morrow did a great deal of, of work. And this was the spectrum that we, we finally published in the C8 stretching region, where we had no interference from the from the silica background. And I'm going to tell you how we interpreted it. I mean, it indicates how we interpreted it uh, and, and, and why. Well, first of all, there was clearly bands above 3,000 wave numbers which could be reliably assigned to an ethylenic pipe, to some sort of uh, uh, saturate uh, 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 C double bond C uh, CH species. And then there were stronger bands and lower wave numbers which were cl clearly true from surface alkane groups. Now, if you knew your organic correlations, one said if you found a band about 3010, that corresponded to a single CH attached to a C double bond C. And if you had a CH2 attached to C double bond C, you expected a much stronger band at about 3080. So the absence of that said that, well, we don't think this is the pi complex which we were looking for. We think it must be one of these dissociatively adsorbed species that have been suggested. Come down here, well, probably the strongest bands here are from uh, our expected uh, disigma species, and we assign them appropriately. This band down here is actually an overtone uh, from a deformation mode, which is well known to occur in the spectrum of alkyl groups attached to metals. So these could be fundamentals, although we did know that there, were, there had to be something else under here because when we varied the temperature, uh, the relative ratio of these two bands varied. But we thought, well, uh, the extra species, which gives a, perhaps a single band, maybe the other dissociatively adsorbed species, but probably the strongest bands are from the disigma species that we were looking for. We then, uh, Barry Morrow, then did an experiment at low temperature and got a simpli notably simplified spectrum. With a single strong band in the alkane region. And this surprised us, uh, because uh, if we had the di-sigma complex, which we would have expected at low temperatures, that has four CH bonds. How can it only give one CH bond stretching uh, fundamental? So we assigned that with some grumbling in the paper to uh, 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 an alkane uh, uh, species with single hydrogens on, on, a, on a carbon atom. There, in, in principle, they could be too fundamental, but one of them might reasonably be weak. But now, I've shown you that assignment, and the interesting thing about it is, is that the assignment is wrong in nearly every respect. <laughs> it's not an easy subject uh, to get the right answers, and it took us about another 15 years before we did sort it out. 
to our final satisfaction. But I have at least indicated that we knew there was something strange in our initial uh, interpretation. Um, as a matter of fact, that was the best sign that you could make of the spectrum with the expectations, the chemical expectations at that time. Uh, um, uh, it doesn't do any harm to be wrong in science, provided you're intelligently wrong. You have good reason for thinking what you do, and others or yourself, you can pick it, you can correct it uh, uh, later on. Of course, if you're, you're stupid or sloppy experimental work, that's another matter. But uh, although that, that, that assignment was, was, was basically all wrong, uh, it, it did stay in the literature for a decade before it was much corrected by ourselves, I may say, initially. <laughs> Well then, uh, about the early 70s, FTIR came along, and the principal difference here was it gave us much more sensitivity, where previously we struggled to get species from hydrocarbons, now it was relatively easy. Uh, in order to go from the interferogram to the normal spectrum, you had to have a mini-computer or a microprocessor, and that gave you uh, computer ratioing, and then at last we caught up with Bob in being able to uh, uh, um, subtract out the, the oxide background even in the angle bending region and to get good spectra down there. And so when we did this, of course, we added another part to the spectrum. Here's what I showed you before, and these are the extra bands which we found at lower wave numbers, down to 1300 wave numbers where the silica blackout means you can't measure anything anymore. Well, what I have done is actually to label the high wave number and the low wave number bands according to species without knowing what the species are. But that is already a simplification. As a matter of fact, <laughs> for a long time, we thought that the strongest band in this part of the spectrum and the strongest band in this part of the spectrum were from different species. We did what sometimes people refer to one experiment too many. Uh, we put ethylene on the surface, and then we uh, added, we, we, uh, we, we post-adsorbed CO. And the result was that this band moved about 10 wave numbers, and this one virtually disappeared. So that for a long while, we thought that these two strongest features were from different species. Uh, well, later on, we, as, as you'll learn, we were able to correct that. But let's start anyway with the idea that by now we know that we've got three different species, each of which gives a band in the upper and the lower wave number region. And the interesting one immediately was the 1500 band, because that's what everybody was looking for, for the pi complex. And yet we'd ruled out the pi complex in the high wave number region for good uh, reasons to do with the standard uh, organic correlations. So we have now at least three species. And the 3015 and the 1500 go together. They have to be the pi complex. Why didn't we get that 3070 absorption band, which we had been expecting? And if the 2880, the strongest band, is the disigma, what is the 1342 absorption? It was difficult to attribute it to that. Um, and anyway, we have three species, and we only have three CH stretching fundamentals. And to at least two of the species must have, each have four CH bonds. What was going on? Uh, and, and we were really rather baffled. And then uh, uh, um, uh, I remembered, uh, going back to Stan Francis's paper, the metal surface selection rule, which operates for flat metal surfaces. Now, we are dealing, of course, not with flat metal surfaces, but on the whole, our catalysts have rather large uh, uh, particles, 50 to 150 mm -hmm. angstrom diameters, and in the electron microscope do show reasonable facets. And one could say, well, the thickness of a monolayer is a great deal less than the diameter of a metal particle. Perhaps uh, some of the facets on the, on the metal particles approximate to flat surfaces, and we can apply the metal surface selection rule. Uh, and uh, um, Howard Pierce was the man, was the, the student who, 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 who uh, looked into this uh, possibility. Um, and it solved many of our problems, as I will show you, but I'm sufficiently concerned with this ad hoc solution that I wrote to Bob, and I said, uh, look, I think that this, this may be uh, an effect. You wouldn't have seen it on your carbon monoxide because the modes you see are all perpendicular to the surface. And Bob wrote back and said he thought, thought that sounded very promising, and so we actually published it as a hypothesis that even on metal particles, the metal surface selection rule was operative. Well, the nature of that selection rule uh, can be looked at in various ways, what I sometimes call the physicist way or the chemist way. This is the chemist way, well, except, of course, it was taught to me by, by a physics lecturer in Cambridge. Um, uh, if you bring a charge up to a metal surface, 
Uh, then, of course, the mobile electrons within, within the metal mean that there's a distribution of negative charge uh, uh, and the lines of force end up perpendicular to the surface. Uh, the, my lecturer at Cambridge just said, well, that's the case, but, of course, the, the, the lines of force outside the surface are exactly what they would have been if you didn't have the surface, but you had a, an equal and opposite image, negatively charged image, uh, below the surface. Now, supposing you have a dipole moment, and a vibrating dipole moment is given for radio intensity, parallel to the surface, it should have an image, effect of an image, with the opposite sign. So that if you were to get, uh, looking for, uh, uh, um, uh, say, radiation from this, there would be radiation of the opposite phase, which would cancel out, if, provided the image was perfect. But in the infrared, of course, metals are very good, uh, are very good conductors. On the other hand, if you put the dipole perpendicular to the surface, the image actually reinforced, and you can expect to get a stronger band, provided your infrared radiation had an electric vector roughly perpendicular to the surface. And therefore, as Bob Greenler early pointed out, what you needed to do was to reflect the light off in near grazing, near grazing incidents. But supposing that was, was true for our, our uh, uh, larger metal particles, then this would have influences on the spectrum that we would see. If this, was the, if this is the sigma species that we were looking for, only one of these would be active, the one in which all the CH modes that vibrate in and out in unison. Uh, one of them would be forbidden simply by symmetry grounds, assuming it was C to be symmetry, and the other two would, would, be, would give dipole changes parallel in one direction or another to the surface. So that here we had a possible explanation of a four CH bond species of the type we were looking for with only a single absorption band in the CH stretching region. So that at least gave us that explanation. And furthermore, when you thought about it, the missing 3050 band from the pi complex was one of the ones that was forbidden by the metal surface selection rule. So we were making some progress anyway. Then about that time, in the mid-1970s, uh, an electron spectroscopy came along which gave us much more intensity for monolayers on flat surfaces. This was originally uh, pioneered by Props and Piper, uh, but they didn't continue it, but uh, several people had met, read their paper and produced their own electron energy loss spectrometers uh, in, in the mid-70s. Uh, and Professor Ebark in particular used that uh, technique to address itself to the sort of chemical problems that we're interested in. And now we move into the era where we know a lot more about the nature of the surface that is giving us a spectrum. For a face-centered cubic metal, those are the, uh, the, the arrangements of the metal atoms. Of course, even uh, within a unit mesh of any one of those, there could be different species. Uh, the the uh, close-packed one could give three-fold species, in fact, two slightly different three-fold species, depending on whether there's another metal atom in the next layer or not or linear species or twofold bridge species. But at least now one is moving to a simplified system where one can be more confident about vibrational assignments. Electron energy loss spectroscopy uh, is analogous in some ways to Raman spectroscopy. Raman could be, be, be um, photon uh, uh, elect, uh, energy loss uh, spectroscopy. You bring monoenergetic electrons into the surface and bounce them off the surface, uh, they uh, uh, um, transfer some of their energy to excite the vibrations in the monolayer, and therefore those electrons leave the surface with reduced energy, and you measure that energy loss. If you make the measurement in the specular direction, angle of instance equals angle of reflection, then in large measure, the, 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 the most potent process is dipolar, as in infrared spectroscopy, and the metal surface selection rule operates. If you go off specular, um, which is possible because the wavelength of electrons are more comparable to the wavelength of the uh, 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 atomic separations in the surfaces, you can pick up weaker features, which however can give you information about parallel modes as well as, as, well as the perpendicular ones. Now, Professor Ebach applied this technique to get a spectrum of ethylene on platinum 111, which of course we were very interested in. Now, the resolution of eels is very poor compared with infrared spectroscopy, typically 30 wave numbers. Today, it is just, just being tuned up to about eight wave numbers uh, at the best. But he got a spectrum, and uh, of course, this spectrum is not uh, 
uh, offset by uh, oxide absorptions, it goes down to the lower wave numbers. And he suggested, and I didn't like the suggestion, and I think uh, 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 that, that it was um, a surface ethylidine group, CH3CH. And then, uh, uh, nobody has suggested that you should get methyl groups from ethylene on metal surfaces. But, and he, but he, he had a band at 1355 under his resolution, which looked awfully like our 1340. And I sort of kicked myself for saying, well, yes, that could be a CH3 species. Uh, anyway, uh, that was the, the, the first spectrum from ethylene on a flat metal surface. And then Sommerjai and his group in Berkeley uh, did low energy electron diffraction and showed that the CC bond was perpendicular to the surface. But if that's the case, yes, the CH3 group is entirely possible. You immediately think, in this, in this type of, of arrangement. And uh, I knew enough, being a chemist, I knew enough about the literature to know there was a, a metal cluster compound which had that species on it. And so I immediately uh, retook its spectrum and superimposed it on the spectrum uh, of the, the surface species. And you see there are uh, coincidences among the absorption band. The res resolution is too poor up here to know exactly what you are. But some of the bands showed up on platinum one one on, and others were missing. But of course, this is a complete spectrum. Uh, this is actually from a, a tricobalt uh, complex, where there's no reason for the metal surface electrodes to be operating. So only some of the modes should be present on the surface. And the question was, were these the perpendicular modes and these the parallel modes? Now, the original assignment of this spectrum <coughs> by, by uh, Bernard Shaw and his colleagues who got it was, to, was, was, was not consistent with that idea. He reckoned this one was, was the CC stretch and therefore the perpendicular mode, and this was a CH3 rock and therefore a parallel mode. But when we repeated, did further work with the CD3 compound, we showed that that assignment did need reversing and it fitted together. And so uh, by that means, with the help of the metal cluster compound, we were able to say, yes, that spectrum corresponds to what we nowadays call the uh, ethylid ethylidine species. Some people call it the notorious ethylidine species, as it's a famous spectator species to a capitalist man. Anyway, so we have this species, and of course certain of the modes have dipoles perpendicular to the surface. They should be present on platinum 111. The others should be missing, at least for specular uh, reflection, which is the nature of the spectrum that Professor Ebach originally got. Anyway, with the help of the cluster compound, we produced a complete assignment for this species, uh, uh, my colleagues in, in, in Norwich. And I wrote to Professor Ebach and said, well, we think it's this species, ethylidine rather than ethylidine, and these are what we think the frequencies are. Of course, some of the frequencies you won't see on, on the surface. And he wrote back and said, well, as a matter of fact, we've just taken the spectrum off specular, and we found such different frequencies, we were wondering whether we were looking at a different species. You've given me a list of them. And so, in a, indeed, off specular, they were picking up the parallel modes as well. And I think that was the first species that was really tied down on a metal surface with little ambiguity. Well, here are some of the spectra on different metal surfaces, uh, which obviously are from uh, the same type of species. And what I have done is to put at the top the, the infrared absorption bands from the model compound, but only uh, drawing out the perpendicular modes which we expect to see on specular on the surface. And you can see pattern recognition while the, the black ones are from the C2H4 absorption and the, the red ones from the C2D4 absorption. Pattern recognition while there's no doubt that that is indeed the species on those particular surfaces. And you'll notice they're all 111 surfaces with threefold sites which is what you have to have for an ethylidine species. Well, that was at room temperature, and uh, Ebark had also done work at ethylene and got a different spectrum at low temperature. Um, so you could apply this same technique to other species for which you had metal cluster compounds. And of course, for the pi complex, everybody used the famous Zeiss salt. And this is, again, just the perpendicular modes for a Zeiss salt for a pi bonded molecule parallel to the surface. And these are the actual spectra. Now here you can see that there is a definite shift as you go from the model compound to the other compounds, which are internally very consistent themselves. But there's not much doubt that the pattern is exactly the same. 
And the reason for the shift is actually not far e easy to find. You've got three uh, strongly electron withdrawing chlorine atoms around the platinum, so that it's the model compound this time which is very atypical relative to a metal surface. But we can pick out the pi complex on quite a few of different metal surfaces of different configurations. Uh, we can uh, try and do the same thing for the disigma complex, uh, and this is, is, is work that we have done uh, in, in, in collaboration with the University of Colorado uh, very, very effectively. Here, again, pattern recognition, not quite so good in this respect, but, uh, let, um, uh, but there are, of course, considerable variations from one uh, surface uh, to, to another. Um, and also, one has to remember that although in the original picture I showed you, I assume that this had C2V symmetry based on coplanar carbon and metal atoms, uh, in fact, there's no reason why it should, strictly speaking, and we suspect that it, this, it's that outer plane nature which is causing some differences. But nevertheless, overall, the pattern is pretty good. And most recently, uh, with, with uh, Professor Norton and his colleagues, we have uh, looked at this model compound where we, uh, it's much, more, much closer to a metallocyclopropane surface species and some of the bands which didn't fit into the other patterns, some of the spectra didn't fit into the other patterns on surfaces also give reasonable agreement with that. So we think now that we can actually uh, uh, identify all the main uh, C2H4 species um, on the metal surfaces, but we haven't solved all the problems for our finely divided catalyst. At that stage, um, reflection absorption infrared spectroscopy uh, received a boost partly because of the success of electron energy loss spectroscopy. And my colleague Michael Chester has applied FT techniques to it, and now we could begin to get spectrum not only from absorbed CO, as, as others had early, but also from hydrocarbons on surfaces. Here, of course, the metal surface selection rule is strict, uh, and we can only see the modes which are perpendicular uh, to the surface. Here are the electron energy loss spectrum I showed you before, the spectrum of the, of the uh, model compounds uh, with the parallel and perpendicular modes, the per parallel ones only showing up off specular on, in eels. And then in, 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 uh, but the, the spectrum here was very poor from eels. Here it's beautifully sharp. You get magnificent resolution. In fact, I think Mike Chester's really surprised himself because uh, 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 the bands are so much sharper than they look with the limited resolution of electron energy loss spectroscopy that the signal to noise is even better than one might have expected. And there, there you, you, you have the ethylidine species uh, uh, definitively defined. And at that time, I told you before, we had problems relating the strongest band here and here together from then on, I believe, despite the CO experiment, they had to be from the same species. I mentioned that Ebach had shown that at room temperature it was a that the spectrum at room temperature which we identified as ethylidine and a different spectrum at low temperature. It happened to be the, 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 the disigma species. So we went back to our own spectra uh, on the finely divided catalyst to redo the low temperature experiment that had originally been done with, but with better resolution from FTIR. Carlos de la Cruz was the student who, who did this. <coughs> So at low temperatures, you, we don't get any of the ethylidine species. But what happens is that the, at, at a better resolution, we split this single band into two. And one component of this, as we raise the temperature to room temperature from whatever it is, 190 K, one of the components goes way down, and up comes the ethylidine. So we're seeing what Ebach had proposed, a transition from disigma to ethylidine, actually on the finely divided metal catalyst as well. And so now we can label all our principal absorption bands on the finely divided catalyst. Uh, C is our ethylidine species. Uh, whoa, sorry, one other point I should have made was that of the two species close together at low temperature, only one of them turned into ethylidine and presumably is disigma on the 111 surface. The other one uh, uh, remained behind. And so we assume this is also of the nature of disigma, but on a different, a non-111 surface. So now uh, we, we have um, the three species identified as the two strongest ones being 
none of the species we originally looked for, being the Thalidine or spectator species, uh, the next two being the Diasigma species, and the, the other two being the Pi complex. So for ethylene on finely divided platinum, we have approximately equal numbers of ethylidine and disigma, uh, simply because uh, uh, the intensity relationship uh, in the conversion to ethylidine, and probably a not very dissimilar amount of the pi complex, because intrinsically the CH absorptions of, of olefins are weaker, as again Stan Francis showed, than those of alkanes. And we had worked out, shall we say, a, a method of sorting things out, that one goes uh, from, the, uh, from the multiple species, which one is really interested in, and one helps to sort them out with the help of one at a time species on single crystal surfaces, and one helps to identify those with the help of metal cluster compounds with structures known from X-ray crystallography. Okay, so we can see and identify the chemists of species, but which of them are catalytically active? We have, I think, I think it was John Yates produced the idea of spectator species, a rather nice description for those species which are not catalytically important. And, of course, to sort this out, you have to go into uh, kinetics. And I don't want to go into that because it would take me too long at this time, except simply to, with, without going into the description, to say that very early on, Neil Avery in my laboratory did some kinetic studies in which we were hoping to get the ethyl group. We didn't. We didn't. We, what we got was the spectrum of the, of the, of, of the product, uh, ethane. But uh, we did show, uh, as John Yates did later, that even when you had no ethylidine species on the surface, the chemical reaction proceeded very happily. There had been proposals in the meanwhile that, that the reaction went on the 1-1-1 one, one, one phase and the ethylidine played a, played a role. Unfortunately, as uh, Neil Avery quickly spotted, the kinetics were somewhat different on our sample than those normally reported, and this was uh, obviously due to diffusion limitation of getting the uh, reagents in and the products out of the finely divided catalysts. But at least for the diffusion limited case, the pi complex always disappeared very quickly, uh, uh, the, so did the di sigma, uh, though less, more slowly, and ethylidine is actually it's part of the hydrogenation process, but it's much slower, it's not catalytically significant. And of course, in principle, one can now go back to powdered catalysts, as Bob started with, using diff diff diffuse reflection in order to, to, study, uh, to, study, uh, to study that. Well, now, I don't want to... Uh, um, <coughs> I'll just end up with, with a, 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 what he would say was a rash generalization that Professor Bond suggested uh, not very long ago, that if you look at metal surfaces, perhaps it's the corner sites which have pi complexes that really matter in terms of the hydrogenation reaction. And all the evidence that uh, and other people from ourselves have shown the pi complex always goes much the most rapidly when you add hydrogen, uh, that on the edge of a crystallite or on, the st or on step sites, Perhaps these are the CC bond breaking sites, which lead ultimately to hydrogenolysis or metathesis. And uh, from the catalytic point of view, the terrace sites, the flat planes, are really rather inert. They're not totally inert. We know that they do actually hydro that ethylidine does hydrogenate off platinum 111 to ethane, but uh, uh, that's uh, an interestingly probably pretty sound generalization. Well, I've told you our particular story here. I just want to make certain that, of course, other people were breathing hard down the back of our necks towards the end of that story. And uh, 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 Tom Beebe and, and John Yates had uh, also quite independently shown the presence of, suggested that the ethylidine was uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, explanation of the strongest features. And they went one further and actually got the CC stretching mode on the finely divided catalyst. And also uh, 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 Michael Trenary uh, did very nice work uh, actually very much paralleling our work from low temperatures to high temperatures to sh seeing the conversion from di sigma to ethylidine and also showing that a little sniff of hydrogen on the pi complex disappears very quickly. And finally, I'd like to show... Uh, uh, I'm pretty convinced that it's the pi complex that's playing the role in hydrogenation. Uh, I, uh, and I was, uh, but on the other hand, uh, nickel 
uh, and ethylene hadn't readily shown the pi complex until recently when Professor Eckert, Eckert and his group at low temperatures had got this very nice spectrum which indeed shows the pi complex or something or the, what, something between the uh, 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 metallocyclopropane and the pi complex on, uh, uh, on, on, on nickel itself. Uh, and my only comment here would be to suggest that I now rather suspect that this so-called sigma pi complex is the metallocyclopropane complex, but that's a very beautiful spectrum. Now, to finish with hydrocarbons, one particularly interesting thing that always excites the inorganic chemist is that spectrum from cyclohexane on a platinum 111 surface, which was originally obtained by Viols and then uh, obtained by Rares. And the interest is this very broad band from obviously a hydrogen bonded CH group uh, interacting doubtless with electron deficient uh, metal atoms. And if you look at the dimensions, Professor Ebach sent the spec eel spectrum to me. And I said, well, if you look at the dimensions and you put your cyclohexane molecule over the surface, you'll find that the three axial CHs are pointing directly at metal atoms. And obviously, this is a sort of precursor to. Uh, CH bond breaking and going from cyclohexane to, 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 to uh, uh, benzene. Well, one can sometimes get spectra from hydrocarbons by Raman spectroscopy. Uh, it's difficult and probably there's a degree of, of enhancement here, but those are some spectra that Krasser and colleagues got from benzene on a uh, on finely divided uh, platinum silica catalyst. And of course, if you have rough surfaces with, with uh, uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, you can get beautiful spectra. But the problem here is, as, as Martin Moskovich has recently shown, that probably uh, this technique brings up one species but doesn't see others that are present. Nevertheless, it gives you beautiful spectra. And nowadays, all these techniques have moved on to electrochemistry, to looking at single crystals on metal surfaces with the added dimension of being able to vary the voltage and see bands change in position and sometimes come and disappear as a function of voltage. So that's an account of some of the metal contributions. How is the time going? You've got about uh, 13 minutes. Right, okay, fine. Well, now let's look at the oxides, and here I can move more rapidly because, <laughs> not surprisingly, I chose some of the same examples that Keith Hall, Hall chose uh, yesterday to show uh, work on the oxides. But here I want to bring out the, the Raman contribution. <coughs> By infrared, you can look at the surface OH groups. You can use CO as a probe of the different surface sites, like different metal sites, uh, you can look at absorbed hydrocarbons. But also, you can use Raman spectroscopy, uh, not only to, to study the surface of the oxide itself, but also the acidity of the adsorbed species. This is a, typical, a spectrum from a high area alumina, where you've got multiple OH groups. And John Perry was the pioneer who uh, uh, tried to assign these to different sites of, uh, 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 of different OH groups on the surface, such as uh, on top, two-fold bridge, three-fold bridge, and so on. I know these assignments actually were more recently from uh, Siganenko and Filimonov in, 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 in Leningrad. And I wouldn't know which is right, uh, John, but, but that just reminds you that, that this can tell you a lot about the nature uh, of the uh, surface, which of course varies with temperature of calcination. You can also use carbon monoxide very effectively uh, even to, to study the OH groups. This is the work of Zekina's group in Torino, and they have a, an excellent group doing superb work. Unfortunately, I couldn't pick out a very simple to, to digest spectrum from their work, but they always tie their infrared spectroscopy with high resolution uh, um, electron. Uh, diffraction, so you can see what sort of surfaces you're looking at. And this again, these are the acidic OHs, one of which uh, adsorbs the carbon monoxide uh, and moves down, is hydrogen bonded, and the carbon monoxide bands come up. At higher pressures, you get physically absorbed CO. But they've also done very beautiful work on basic oxides, like magnesium oxide and calcium oxide. They're a major area of good research in this field. CO can go on the, the transition metal oxides and can readily uh, 
help to pick out uh, the uh, presence of uh, different oxidation states. This is the work of Anatole Davidov from Novosibirsk in, 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 in Russia uh, uh, now, and I draw your attention to the book that he's written on the spectron transition metal oxides. They've done a great deal of work on this in Russia, and we tend to be rather ignorant uh, of it. And here you've got a, a partially reduced nickel catalyst where the CO is showing up separately the fully reduced nickel and the different oxidation states. This spectrum was shown by Keith Hall yesterday. It's one of my favorites, a good strong hydrogen bond from an acidic OH to a hydrocarbon. I always like that spectrum. Um, Bob did some very nice work from hydrogen on zinc oxide, and again, as, as Keith mentioned yesterday, leading to heterolytic dissociation. Nowadays, you can remeasure those spectra with FT and get down to the angle deformation region and see the OH deformations, as well as the, the uh, uh, ZNH and OH stretches. And in this case, and this was initially the work of Zerkina, which we followed up, there is an additional species which we think is the bridge species. When you look at an oxide surface, some of the faces have equal numbers of oxide and zinc ions. Others are zinc rich or oxygen rich, and one suspects that this bridge species is on one of the zinc rich surfaces. There was a very beautiful work that Cochrus did. Again, I pick, picked it out uh, because uh, he showed that he definitely had the symmetrical uh, allyl uh, complex. I think, I, I think essentially it's a negatively charged uh, complex. He did very nice experiments by doing work with CH3, CH, CD2, and CD3, CH, C, CH2, and getting the same spectrum from the hydrocarbon and either OH and OD from the dissociated uh, CH bond. Infrared spectroscopy has one advantage uh, for catalysis, and that is you can very often interpret the spectra. If it's small molecules, you can, all, you can invariably uh, identify them in the gas phase, and you can often, particularly on oxide surfaces, which are easier to interpret than metal surfaces, you can identify them on, the surface, on, on, on oxide surfaces. So one technique to study the catalytic properties of a system is to gradually take spectra of the gas phase and of the surface species at a different range of temperatures see what the products are that come off in the gas phase, I identify them with the species which are disappearing on the surface. Uh, and this technique was, was introduced to me by, by an Egyptian colleague, uh, uh, Mohamed Zaki, and his group uh, and ourselves have col collaborated to uh, get quite a lot of information about some systems. Uh, for example, the uh, interaction, the reaction of ethanol over uh, an OH-rich titania uh, sample you can follow the gas phase species rather readily. Here is the initial ethanol, and then uh, this, this persists, but 300 degrees of spectrum changes. You get a strong band coming up, which at first you're surprised about, and then you realize it's diethyl ether, and then later on you get the expected uh, uh, ethene from the uh, dehydrogenation, dehydration uh, reaction. And at higher temperature, and at higher temperatures, you begin to get uh, some uh, initial, even, even a touch of of benzene there, remarkably, which must have come from some form of acetylene, uh, and so on. And you could follow the same thing over the same temperature range, although each time taking the sample down to room temperature to freeze where you've got to. Uh, um, on the surface, you can see ethoxides. First of all, uh, some physically absorb ethanol. That disappears. The, the ethoxide persists. That gradually changes. You get carboxylates and water, and, and so on. So that's a useful sort of technique, making use of the fact that the infrared spectroscopy, we, we can identify species really very readily. And uh, for that particular reaction, this is the sort of thing that happened, that as the ethanol uh, disappeared in the gas phase, first of all, the diethyl ether, and then the ethene appeared in the vapor phase, uh, and of course, water, although a lot of that actually stayed on the surface. Um, and then at very high temperatures, you've got some other uh, uh, species uh, as well. But these obviously were derived from the ethoxide species that were on the surface, decomposing as a temperature rise. And uh, Le Valley in, in, in Caen, in, in France, has shown from methoxide that you can actually distinguish between a methoxide bonded to uh, one metal 
uh, cation or to two metal cations, rather like CO on metal. Uh, and if the same thing applies to um, uh, ethoxide, well, one of, the, one of the interesting things is that if you, with the titania, if you repeat the experiment with the titania that is uh, being calcined to much higher temperature and is OH free, then you get much more of the uh, um, uh, um, much more of the uh, um, dehydrogenation uh, coming in. Uh, and is it perhaps that you have two different species, one of which goes through to give dehydration, and the other which gives through, goes through to give dehydrogenation? We don't know. That's experiments which need to be followed up. Moving on to Raman spectroscopy, it is very useful for determining something about the surface of uh, oxides such as molybdenum and tungsten oxides uh, and the like. Here are certain known species in the liquid state. Here they are identified on the surface of a catalyst, calcined, well, first of all dried and then calcined, and then in addition to those ionic species, you can see the MOO3 <coughs> uh, uh, oxide uh, growing up. Or one can, uh, uh, by Raman spectroscopy, adsorb pyridine to look at acid acidic sites. And without going into any detail, there are major differences between uh, a potassium Y zeolite and a cerium Y zeolite. The difference being that the cerium one has a, a different pattern of bands corresponding to much more uh, Lewis type acidity uh, than, the, than, the, than, the, than the potassium one. Or that's a spectrum from acetylene on a zeolite. The Ra Raman spectroscopy comes into its own because the Raman spectrum of the oxides themselves are very weak. And sometimes, with a bit of luck, you actually find that you've got a resonance Raman spectrum. That was a spectrum we got, uh, which we thought was going to be from acetylene on titania. Uh, in fact, quite clearly, uh, it is from uh, polymerized uh, acetylene on titania, giving a resonance Raman spectrum and the characteristic overtone as well as the fundamental bands. A spectrum which has been seen quite often recently on, on metal titania uh, or, or alumina samples, which I'm sure is actually on the oxide rather than on the metal. Well, I think I'm going to mix, miss out the halides, but I do want to emphasize that if you want to really see beautiful academic type spectra, go to the halides. Um, that, um, well, I'll show, you, I'll, I'll show you some finely divided ones, first of all, which are much cruder but have chemical significance. This is some work that Roger Smart and I did. Uh, if you put HCl on sodium fluoride at room temperature, finely divided sodium fluoride, you get uh, a spectrum which at first sight surprises you, but you realize is the bifluoride. And obviously, there's been an exchange between the, uh, uh, between the, the negatively charged species. And uh, we went to cesium chloride because that gives us a big range of spectrum free of, uh, of absorption bands from the halide. And there is the straight hydrogen bonding situation from HCl, the OH stretch, the deformation, and the vibration against the surface. But if you go to low temperatures and use very small molecules on flat, uh, uh, and you can get very flat uh, halide surfaces, uh, you can get beautifully resolved spectra from carbon monoxide, uh, from hydrogen. You can show it actually rotates even at 10K. Uh, from, uh, uh, from you can see the splitting of, of degeneracies due to the surface forces. You can see even uh, what's, what the, the spectroscopy professional call correlation field splitting from two molecules in the <coughs> cell. Very beautiful spectra by George Ewing in the United States uh, and uh, by... Um, so let me just... Sorry, I just lost the name for the moment. Uh, yes, and by, by Professor Heidberg in Germany. And the pioneer of the halide surfaces was Fallman in Israel. Semiconductors, we can now apply ATR with great precision. And some beautiful work has been done from absorption of, even of hydrogen on silica and so on by multiple ATR. We heard, had a very interesting paper yesterday about some frequency spectroscopy, and I thought it might be just helpful to look at this in slightly wider uh, perspective. Uh, um, it is a second order phenomenon, as was explained, with the effect that it only occurs at the surface, and you can go through solid, uh, liquid, or, or, or bulk phases without exciting any, any spectrum. 
uh, other than such absorption that is there. And so this has quite a lot of promise, I think, for things like uh, monolayers between oil and water surfaces and things of this sort. It is, however, uh, confined to flat surfaces. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, it is the only species I know in which you can tell whether the molecule is sticking up or down. And if, if it's that sensitive, of course, if you have a spherical one, the two effects cancel out, and you see no, no effect at all. It, 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 uh, it is confined to, to flat surfaces that has a great deal of, of, of promise. It was pioneered by Shen in Berkeley. And finally, uh, a, a topic I haven't discussed before, inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy, is a way of getting vibrational spectra without a spectrometer. Because uh, what one does is you take uh, a depo uh, 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 an evaporated deposit of finely divided oxide, such as alumina, between two different metal electrodes. And, uh, um, and then you absorb species on the alumina. The two different metal electrodes means there's a difference between the Fermi levels of the two of them. But as you uh, scan the voltage difference between the two, every time you pass through a vibration frequency of an intervening molecule, you get an, you get a, a, an absorption band. So here is a spectrum of, uh, what is it? It's a large organic molecule uh, on alumina. And you can see it's the same type of spectrum that you get from the infrared or the Raman in resolution. In fact, it has features which would be strong in both types of, of spectra. Uh, the only disadvantage of this from the point of view of, of, of a surface chemist uh, is that you have to actually take the experiments with a, with a sample in liquid helium, uh, which means you can't do any gas phase studies over the surface. However, I mention this technique finally because of a challenge which I put out a year or two ago and which I don't think has ever been quite achieved yet. Uh, can we scan, can we... Uh, use this method with scanning tunneling microscopy to actually get the vibrational spectrum of one molecule sitting on one particular site. In the, uh, the, the scanning tunneling microscopy, by uh, varying the, 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 uh, the voltage, it's been possible, for example, if you have mono, uh, combined monolayers of CO and benzene, at, at, at certain conditions to see the CO band strong, and another uh, CO species strong, and another to see the benzene one strong. In principle, we could sit over a molecule, uh, of course I've got disigma in there, uh, um, and uh, of course this has to be at low temperatures, the molecule has to stay there, uh, will it be ever possible for us to actually measure the vibration spectrum of one molecule on a particular site on one surface? Thank you. We have certainly had a tremendous coverage a lot of material here. Um, we're running a little short, but if anybody would just like to take one quick question for Norman. Yes. Anybody with anything quick? Oh, well, okay. If they won't, I will. Uh, just because, no, I, I want something straightened out for me because you talked about the selection rules on small particles. Yes. And I almost thought that the illustration you first made of having selection rules on small particles, then later you maybe decided you didn't have that species after all, or was, was I mistaken? Do you, where, do you yes, it, we thought it was a disigma species. It you, turned out to be a thalidine. Yeah. But the selection rules have held in, both, in either case. OK, so you still have selection rules on those small, some small particles. Yes, and this is where, where Bob Greenland did some very nice work. He, from a colleague at Northwestern, he got a, a series of catalysts with different size of metal particles and investigated, well, having worked it out theoretically and suggesting that perhaps on a typical metal, uh, a metal particle of the diameter of 20 angstroms might be beginning to show the effect of the, uh, uh, <coughs> of the breaking down of the metal surface mm -hmm. selection rule went down. He then did experimental work, which, which I think Bob more or less confirmed that that was the situation, that for very small particles it goes, but at, at, at larger particles uh, it can be affected. Is that about, would you, <laughs> around 20 angstroms, do you think that is uh, switching over? I don't think that's really been demonstrated experimentally. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, okay, because I know I have some evaporated metal films in which the selection <coughs> rules do not hold. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so that's, I've always been interested in this, where, where is this change over? No, there certainly are, are spectra in the literature, some I showed from, 
Michael Trenner has shown quite clearly that, that the, the uh, high complex had other absorption patterns mm -hmm. from small metal particles. It only applies to larger uh, metals. All right, well, thank you very much for a tremendous survey here.